and welcome to the San Francisco World Vegetarian Festival. Uh, we have with, with us here Lani Mulra. She's got a lot of titles before her name, so she's an extremely well-educated woman. <laughs> the bottom line is she specializes in helping people who struggle with health, weight, and energy uh, to transform their bodies and their lives without going hungry and with as little exercise as possible. Um, she's been featured in numerous uh, uh, media, uh, uh, prevention, ABC television, Saturday Evening Post, and her own program, Lonnie's All Heart Aerobics and CBSD. <laughs> I give you Lonnie Mora. <laughs> Thanks so much for the introduction, and it's true, This I just picked this up on the way to the airport, the uh, Saturday Evening Post <laughs> did, and we'll be doing this a bit quick today, we did it yesterday in the exercise session, I'll teach you a different um, variety of it today, but first, uh, thank you for coming this afternoon, I'm happy to have you eating your food here, because I'm all about eating, and that's what we're going to talk about today. <coughs> I also see a few familiar faces from yesterday, so, and I've got to say congratulations. I saw a few people doing the, uh, you know, lessons from yesterday. I even saw one of these, the little higher assets, even though we didn't get time to, you know, teach it all. But star in the chart for following through on that. And as you know, um, I'm the author of Fit Quickies 5 Minute Targeted Body Shaping Workouts, but this, it's, I call this a Trojan horse book because it's not just about the fitness. It's about also a couple of other really important issues that I'm going to talk about more with you today. And just, just to take you down that road, to get what you want with your health and you, your weight, you have to go three for three. And if you don't get all these three in alignment, then your success will be lopsided or short-lived or and not optimal. But once you get all three of these in alignment, you will have absolutely brilliant success. So what are the three, right? I call them um, the three pillars of healthy success. Movement, eating, and mindset. This is a snap from a video on my website that's about the three pillars if you want a nice brief overview to go look at it. But for short order I call it the three F's. The food, the fitness, and the frame of mind. All three are important. And for those of you who haven't seen my picture here, I do have an interesting 50 pound weight loss and I'm going to go through this story with you today and tell you a little bit about the changes that took place. But all three of these pillars had to be sharpened and cultivated to me, for me to have lasting success. And it, well think about it. If you can get control of your food, you can get control of more than you ever thought possible. And if you can get control over or some degree of mastery over your habits of thinking, then you can get more control over the food. And if you add physical activity to the equation, you give muscle to the whole operation. Physical activity restores physical confidence, it boosts your brain power, and it, we know for a fact that people who engage in regular exercise feel more in control of their food choices. And haven't you experienced that yourself? You know when you're getting your exercise in, it translates to the food. So there are many people in the plant-based movement who will tell you it is all about the food. And I agree to a certain extent because I say if you can get the body involved, get something physical going, it makes the food thing all so much easier. It's back and forth. The food makes the fitness easier and the fitness makes the food easier. <coughs> So as a matter of fact, um, anecdotally, and I shared this yesterday too, when I was approached by Penguin Publishing to do a book about my five minute workouts, well, I, of course I didn't say no. I said okay, because it, it was already up in video um, version on my website. And I said fine, but, but we have to include the food, especially the whole foods plant-based diet, and we also need to include the mindset, motivation, and mastery piece because that was instrumental in my success and in what I, my teachings and how I coach others. So to really be honest, it has to have all three. And they said fine. So we had a great relationship going on from there. So here's the plan for you to, with for us today. Uh, as I told you, I'm going to tell you a little bit about my journey because I don't know about you, but when I 
can follow someone else's story. It helps me connect with certain points that might identify with me. Or maybe someone that you know who struggles with a weight problem. This will be helpful to you to connect with them. Uh, and then here's your takeaways for immediate action. I'm all about you taking something away from here of value, whether or not you buy my book, that you can apply right away. And I did that yesterday. Everyone, you went away with even the exercise, willpower workout. I'm going to do another willpower workout today, so everyone will get a new tool on that. Um, we're going to talk about the three rules of satiety, which is my simple way of putting it all together for making a whole foods, plant-based diet work for easy weight management. Can I be honest with you here? All I ever wanted was to be full without being fat. <laughs> okay, that's really, that's what I, that was the, the holy grail for me. That's what I wanted. And it, it was a long journey for me to find that place, but I knew I would find that match. And that's what I'm about to tell you about today. But something that really helped me make that happen was what I now call the three rules of satiety. Three simple tools you're going to be able to walk out of here with to help you down the road that I have traveled down. Uh, I'll give you a two minute move guaranteed to restore mental clarity. In other words, you didn't think you were going to get here and not do a little physical activity, right? <laughs> That's okay, you don't need any dumbbells, you don't need special clothing, I'll just get you on your feet. I'll teach you a willpower workout as I did yesterday, just a little different variety. And then also some bonus plant-based tips, a short list of things, that, tools that I found really helpful. So, sound like a good plan? Yes. All right. Okay, people uh, tell me today that they find it hard to believe that I ever had a weight problem. But I did. I'm the one on the left. <laughs> It doesn't help that everyone else in the picture is skinny, you know. <laughs> but I am one of those people born genetically predispositioned to easily gain weight. I don't know if you can identify with that or if maybe you have a friend who can identify with that. I'm the one on the right in this picture. Interestingly enough, this is my sister and she looks tall and skinny, but now she has many more weight challenges than I do. But my whole point with showing you this picture is that Predisposition is not destiny. Your genetics may load the gun, but we fire the trigger with our behaviors and with what we do with our environment and what we move, how we move and what we eat. And uh, particularly, something very important for you to know about if you do struggle with a weight problem or know someone who does, I, I, think, I guess I can stop saying that, you know what I mean. I want to be courteous to all. But there are a couple specific things you can do immediately that make a difference that I really enjoy knowing about and I bet you will too. And that has to do with LPL. LPL is actually the acronym for lipoprotein lipase. This is connected to a genetic predisposition that is tasked with an enzyme, actually LPL is an enzyme, tasked with the job of extracting fats from your bloodstream and depositing them into one of two places. Either into your fat cells for storage or into your muscle cells to be used as energy. Now where do you want yours to go? Okay, that was a pretty easy choice. We want it to go to our muscle tissue. So our genetic predisposition has selected for us which one is stronger, but there are two simple things you can do to impact the action of LPL to make it more encouraged in your muscle cells and in your fat cells. Guess what they are? Movement, body movement, and also the whole foods low fat plant based diet. This is the description as I was saying LPL this is the description I just told you. To fat cells for storage or to your muscle cells to be used for energy. So to amp down those fat genes, if indeed you do have them, eating a whole foods low fat plant based diet diminishes the expression of this gene in your fat cells and encourages it in your muscle cells and physical activity does the same thing. So there's another good reason for being more active and eating whole foods low, pan, low fat plant based diet. All right. Um, so I put this picture in. I'm kind of trying to move through my life experience here. I'm a board, four years old here. Is that a crack up or what? I just, you know, vegetarian, I had to show this picture because here I am <laughs> next to this big chunk of who knows whatever animals roasting on the spit. But actually, I do give credit to my parents for encouraging a healthy lifestyle from early on. My parents had a big organic garden. My mom froze all her vegetables. Um, my dad worked out in the Jack Lane gym and my mom worked out with Jack Lane at home. My mom would not be caught dead with a donut or any kind of that kind of 
chips in the house. And my first recollections of the health food store in the old days, you know, I'm 61. This is 61 on a plant-based diet and fit cookies and a little bit of running. <laughs> but we'd go to health food stores to get stuff that was sugar-free. This is when health food stores were like, you know, pill shops kind of. And <laughs> yeah, so I do credit them, but I just had to put that. You understand why I had to put that picture in to, for a vegetarian society. So as I progressed through my life, I, I have like a 30-year struggle w of weight before I went through my 50-pound weight loss. 15 years ago. Don't, you know, I don't want to get you crazy with the math. But that's a long time that I struggled to find the answer. So even, you know, I thought as soon as I went vegetarian, which is like 40 years ago, that the weight would just melt off and the problem would solve itself. Well, that wasn't true. But again, to my parents' credit, they searched all over town to find a bakery that would make an eggless cake. <laughs> and in those days, it was no easy task. There were no vegan bakeries and any of that. So as a vegetarian, I was not eating eggs. I was eating um, da other dairy products and otherwise no animal, nothing. So uh, it, speaking of cake, somehow I always managed to be the person <laughs> who would volunteer to, you know, cut the cake at the whatever party was going on, because you never know when you might fall face first into a pile of frosting, <laughs> right? Just. However, I did not let my weight challenges get in the way of my fitness aspirations, whether in my personal fitness or in my, my vocation, you know, in helping other people. This is my first... Um, Half marathon many, many years ago. Here's the, the long the caption to this is you can't out train a bad diet. Now, keep in mind, uh, my diet was a lot better than the people around me, my, the other college students. I wasn't eating the burgers, I wasn't eating the fries, you know, I was being healthy vegetarian. But there were certain elements that because of my genetic predisposition, I needed to shift, but it took me many decades to figure that out. But I'm going to tell you the story. You're in luck. You're the inside track. So there were periods of time when I was able to manage my weight. This is from my um, fitness show, Lanny's All Heart Aerobics. And I could maintain my weight for you know, periods of time through micromanagement, which is exhausting. If you've ever been a calorie counter, a portion counter, a, you know, a zone person where you count micrograms of, have you ever done that, like this many? Anyway, it would work for a period of time, but eventually I would just get exhausted of the whole process, the mental, mentally addled from it, and I'd get hungry. You know, by trying to count and weigh, measure portions, it just, it would give me what I called stored hunger over a period of time. Here's an example of what I mean. Can anyone relate to this? It's like, but I got to tell you, so about, this is about 15 years ago in Switzerland, and I finally, this is actually 15 pounds lower than my high weight, which, by the way, was 189.5. <laughs> I stopped just short of 190, and this is probably at about 175 when I'd already started to lose a little bit of weight. But the, here's how I did that initially. I gave up dieting. I'd had it. I figured I'll, maybe I'll just be one of those healthy at any size people. You know, maybe that's just what it's going to be like because I could not do the micromanaging anymore. I could not tolerate the heartache of losing some pounds and gaining them back and then trying to find a new avenue and just uh, too much. So I did give up dieting and eventually I did start to lose a little bit of weight because actually my diet had improved because I wasn't going hungry anymore. And you know what happens when we go hungry. All bets are off for what's going to satisfy that hunger when it overcomes you. So here is very key and central to what I call, I guess you could call it recovery. Um, you know, I don't, don't call myself an addict at all. But for this change for me, this transformation, let's put it that way, was I, my core belief was that my hunger signals couldn't be wrong or faulty. That means, wouldn't it be cruel if we had, these bodies were built with these hunger and fullness signals that were going to be tricks to us and that were going to try to catch us so that we'd have this weight problem and that you know all this other suffering around the whole weight thing if you've ever experienced it would take place. I just thought there must be a reason that a way that I can get this to work for me. We live in the woods north here up in the hills above Chico 
and we have this uh, land, we're right in the middle of five acres, and we're surrounded by wildlife. This is Rocky, our rescue squirrel. We rescued her from our woods two years ago. She comes over every day and swings in the hammock with us and eats peanuts out of our lap, and she lets us give her massages, and then she takes off to her tree, wherever it is. But she's, she, you know, she'll eat peanuts to her heart content. She doesn't have a weight problem. <laughs> She's not counting grams of this and that. She's not saying, I've had too many carbs, I better cut back. <laughs> and the same thing with the deer, you know, they're just, and it's not like there's pl not plenty of food for them. They have plenty to eat. The bear comes through and he lifts up the big compost bin and, you know, goes for the gusto in there. And, you know, he's, they all have these natural singles. So for years I thought, what do they get that I'm not getting. Why would my body be different from there then? You see what I'm saying here? It was just, I was really kind of obsessed by this idea. This is an article that went up on my blog. By the way, I invite you to come by landymuleath.com. I have the plant-based blueprint free for a download, the full version if you get the book. I've got articles and articles about all plant-based fitness, you know, all angles of it. But about a year ago, what is this, 2012, year and a half? I put up this article called My McDougal Diet Failure. Now this got a lot of attention because I just happened to be the fitness advisor for the McDougal Health and Medical Center discussion boards. So what, you know, McDougal and failure in the same sentence don't go too well to the public. But in this story, which by the way, springboarded the entire nutrition chapter in the Fit Quickies book, the, the seeds of that and the, the idea that that I'm going to give forward to you and these three rules of satiety are seated in this article. But long short for you, uh, you are all familiar with Dr. McDougall, correct? Yes. And he advocates a low food, whole food, I got to figure out a shorter version of that, whole foods, low fat, plant-based diet. And his um, message is the same as what I'm telling you, how to be full without being fat. Because he would always say, well, you can eat till you're full, just don't eat these foods, you know, and eat these foods. And so several years ago, I think I got the first McDougal diet book that came out in 1983, the McDougal plan. And oh, the message really appealed to me because you see how it was a match for my ideology. I thought, this is great. And I tried it for a few days. I got hungry and I abandoned it. It didn't work. A few years later, I tried it again. I just, two or three times, I tried this approach and I couldn't quite get why it wouldn't work for me. And then finally, about five years ago, I was invited to be a guest at a physician seminar where Dr. McDougall was going to be presenting all day. I present for the CHIP program, the Complete Health Improvement Program by Dr. Hans Steele. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, excellent. It's a community-based program rather than these immersion programs where you spend, you know, several thousand dollars and go somewhere and eat well for a weekend. These are community-based so that you can get lessons, go home, and apply and keep coming back. So they had invited me to come to this physician seminar and I went and Dr. McDougal presented all day about benefits of Whole Foods plant-based diet. Hey, I got it out right that time. And its impact on our health and our weight. Now here's the thing, you guys. This was in front of a room full of cardiologists at the hospital. So you can imagine, you know, the cardiologist crowd because they're coming from the medical treatment, disaster treatment standpoint. And Dr. McDougall is also co-prevention based. But I tell you about this particular day because it was pivotal for me for understanding how to make this whole foods plant-based diet work for ma uh, matching my be, hung be full without being fat ideology. Eating a I wanted to be a body managed eater. In other words, I want my body to tell me when it's time to eat and how much to I have to eat and I just t uh, provide the quality food to make the match. You see what I mean? But this is the, when I left the session, I came away with the seed for these three rules of satiety that I immediately began to apply and that really were pivotal to my success. So those are the tools I want to give to you. The other thing I came away from this seminar with was that I still had deep-seated vestiges of what is known as carbophobia. You know the term carbophobia? You know it's actually a medical term? Look at this. According to the Journal of American Nutrition Review, it is a form of nutrition misinformation infused into the American psyche through multiple advertising avenues that include magazine ads, television infomercials, and especially best-selling diet books. Now, I thought that long ago I had been cured of carbophobia, but I noticed upon leaving that seminar that I told you about that I was still holding back 
to my disadvantage on eating freely of the whole grains, the potatoes, all of those foods. And actually, I ate bread every day of my weight loss. So when someone says, you know, just I'll let you do with it with that, whatever you want to do with that. But I was still holding back a little bit, and it's tied into these three rules, which I'll go in and tell you about. So before I go into those three, first I want to clarify. There are two terms that we use interchangeably, satiety and satiation. They're slightly different. Satiation is the satisfaction that results at the end of a meal. Like, you know, you sit down and you eat, and then it's, ah, oh, I've had enough. Satiety is that lasting sense of hunger satisfaction that will carry a few hours until the next meal. Now, for our purposes, we're going to lump them together because I didn't want to call it the three rules of satiation and satiety. I just wanted it simple, so I'm calling it the three rules of satiety. But you want your food to do both of these for you, don't you? All right, so here they are. Weight, stretch, and energy or nutrition. And we're going to start with weight. Not your weight. No one has to weigh in today. <laughs> Don't be frightened. But this is fascinating to me, and you may know this. Do you know that every day we eat in weight the same amount as we eat every other day? In other words, if you take all the food you ate today, this goes for all of us, and put it in a basket and weighed it, and then tomorrow you took all the food that you ate and put it in a basket and weighed it, and then the next day you see where I'm going with this? All right? I don't. I hope I'm not going to eat as much tomorrow as I eat. <laughs> <laughs> I caught her on the exception I day. I even 1.30. Yeah. Well, that's because you're at Veg Fest and there's too much. <laughs> okay, you get my point though. No, good point because, you know, we all have the Thanksgivings. It's just when we have them every day that it's really problematic. <laughs> so this is really good information. Because, so is it clear what that means that we eat about the same amount of food? So what does that tell you about what the quality of the food that is in your basket, how it might have an impact on your weight? So let's take an example. This again is the explanation. Um, this is all quoted in the book, by the way. I have all of this research noted in there. So I am going to be signing books right outside the door afterwards if you're interested. So let's take two foods. Let's take cheese and apples, all right? Let's take, I said that the, theory, the principle was weight. So let's take a pound of apples and a pound of cheese. Two apples is about a pound. I went into the market and weighed it, two kind of medium-sized apples. And you know what a pound of cheese looks like. It's that kind of a brick. And they take up about the same amount of space, right? But if you isolate this rule of satiety, which is actually one that we do know exists. It's one of the reasons we get hunger and fullness, this weight thing. Isolate that factor alone. Which one of these foods is going to be more likely to hit that weight that you eat every single day before the other and overshoot your calorie requirements for the day? See what I'm saying here? Now we get our fullness for many reasons. Many that we know a lot about, such as this one, and there are several reasons that we haven't discovered yet, but we do know this one exists. So again, I say if you just isolate that one reason, we all agree that if it's just on the weight alone, a pound of apples and a pound of cheese are going to have a completely different calorie impact by the time they meet that one pound of weight. All right, let's look at the other one is stretch. Do you know about the stretch receptors in the gut? That's another thing that we know about in science. When you eat, and I call it gut because it's not just your stomach, it's your intestines and all that, everything going on down there. There are stretch receptors that are fired off when your gut reaches a certain area of distension. That's another way your body says, I've had enough to eat. Okay? So what does this tell you now then about what comprises what's going in and creating that stretch? Let's take the same two foods to keep it simple take the apples and let's take the cheese. By the time the apples or the cheese stretch the gut to fire off those receptors, which one of those is more likely to have you overshoot your calorie requirements for the day by the time it meets that one requirement, the stretch? Okay, same thing. And probably even less because cheese is so full of fat that as you eat it, it melts down and it just kind of, you know, there's no fiber in it, so it's not going to give you some good stretch reception. So, you see, this is, I kind of evolved these ideas over the course of this seminar, and I thought, you know, this, he didn't deliver them in this format. 
but I started to put it together that this is what my problem has been. I have to make all of these things work. And rule number three was, um, oh, we'll do rule number three in a minute. And uh, you've seen this, but Dr. Forrester talked about this a little bit last night as well. Just to compare, you already figured out easily it was a cheese that would overshoot calorie requirements before the apples, but we want to compare our calorie content of food. Apples and other fruits are about 300 calories a pound. Chocolate cheese, 2,000 calories a pound, give or take. All right? Now, here's rule number three is the energy or nutrition. We talked about the stretch receptor phenomenon, very obvious sign of fullness. There are also nutrient receptors. And this, by the way, you guys, I think was where my biggest problem was. Nutrition is not just your vitamins and minerals and your, their macronutrients, it's also calorie content. If you are not eating sufficient calories, then you will have what I called, over the course of a few days, stored hunger. I think we referred to this a little bit earlier in the talk, which always stimulates, because of your survival mechanism, to seek out all the highest fat, highest sugar food in the environment because your body is biologically programmed to want to store and manufacture excess body fat because, well, heaven's sake, we may be in a survival situation. We may have an extended period of time. I always say our, our biology is not caught up with our technology, right? So in my efforts to seek to manage my weight by being a good vegetarian and eating, you know, lots of vegetables and salads and things, I, and my carbophobia, I would go through too many periods of times when I was having deficient calorie intake, especially since I was very active. I was always fit. I was either running or, you know, teaching aerobics classes. And I told you I never let this stop me. I was teaching step classes and swim classes and all that stuff and, you know, just one person once asked me if I was pregnant, and I said no. Oh. You know, you can't take that one back, right? <laughs> you can't take that one back. So this, I think, was one where, where one of my biggest problems was, and this is where I got the idea that I must be having a little bit of carbophobia. So as soon as I left that conference, I started applying these rules. I went home and I started eating more freely of piles of rice, you know, potatoes with my meals, along with the other vegetables, and and I eliminated vegetable oils. So the biggest changes that happened to me, besides behaviorally with these things, was eliminating vegetable oils and uh, dairy products. That made a big difference, too, for weight management. Um, here's the long short, and I'll tell you a little bit more about the oils, too. Foods and edibles parading is food. We all know what those are, that squeeze a lot of calories into a tiny package, have the potential to add lots of calories to your meal before you've had your fill. Okay, that's an overview of those three rules. So here's a very good example of how to be fat before you're full. This is the vegetable oil thing. Olive oil, one tablespoon, 120 calories, takes up a little teeny tiny bit of space. Here's a whole two-thirds of a cup of whole olives, lots of fiber, same amount of calories. So it's very easy to overshoot when you're doing um, vegetable oils in your diet. And by the way, then I get people who say, oh, but I feel so much more satisfied when I eat higher fat foods and I need to have more, you know, more fat in my meals so that I have longer satiety. Well, guess what? The research doesn't support it because even though you may have that feel of satiation right after meal with more fat, if, the, if we've done research where we'll take people and have higher fat content in their diet or higher carbohydrate in their diet, and it, they ha the higher fat people, it does not control their calorie intake. Actually, here's the, the, one of the research pieces I'd like to share with you. They took these two groups of people, one group, they all had 400 calories breakfast, the same breakfast. And then one group was given 362 added fat calories in the form of a supplement. Another group was given 362 added carbohydrates in the form of a supplement. And these people were all told to eat ad libitum. That means eat according to appetite the rest of the day. The high fat supplement did not curb appetite by the end of the day. The carb supplement people had suppressed appetite, whereas by the high fat people did. So if you think you're helping yourself out, suppressing your appetite by eating more fat, at day's end, 
you're going to end up overshooting your calories and probably because a lot of those other reasons we've already talked about. So the research supports that. Just real quick, this is um, Karen, one of my clients. She's a very high-powered nurse in the, in the field back east. She travels to Africa several times a year to teach at nursing college there. She needed a quick exercise program and how to translate whole foods low fat to traveling. But I like to show her because look at her profile. And all she did was she added those five minute fitness breaks. She decreased the oil in her diet and she started adding more of the fibrous foods. And this is her uh, lipid profile. She had very dramatic changes in her cholesterol and triglycerides and she was, you know, here's this very pragmatic nurse. She did a weight graph and everything. So it's always fun to show progress. Long short, if you don't understand why processed, fiber-free, and high-fat foods are the problem, you'll be stuck continually fighting a war with hunger that you'll never win. You can't win it on white knuckle, knuckle hunger. And who wants to be at war with their body anyway? We're biologically driven to satisfy your urge for a full belly because our bellies were designed to be satisfied with whole real food. Okay? I keep reinforcing my ideal here, see? That's what I wanted. I wanted to be full without being fat and I knew my body was built that way for a reason. So here's my big plate trick. You guys have heard the small plate trick, right? I call it the big plate trick because you need to eat mountains of food when you are eating whole foods, low fat, plant based. And this is one of the problems that people have when they're making the change because they're used to the portions. And then they try to do the same thing with our food and it's not enough you end up going hungry. So I say use a bit, I, I always, I'm always telling my husband Greg, honey, we're going to need to get bigger plates. You know, everything's just kind of falling off the edges. <laughs> but I like to keep it, this is actually from the plant-based blueprint, some pictures from there. So if you download that, you'll see. My food plan for the day is very simple. If I were to look back on my day of food, if I put it all in a big platter, half of it would be all the high water content vegetables. I, you know, broccoli and cauliflower and cabbage and radishes and hickam and all those things. The other half would be the starchies. That's what I call the whole grains and starchy vegetables. I put them kind of in one group. And then on top there would be uh, maybe two to four pieces of fruit, a couple cups of beans, a few nuts and seeds. And that's kind of as complex as I like to make it. There's the, the cover of the, um, the whole version is like 60 pages. I put it on a beautiful PDF so it's Kind of a nice feast for the eye. This is just some pieces from it I wanted you to see. Making my soup in the kitchen. The World Burger. This is the big hit with non-veggies, by the way. You know the secret? You put a little tempeh in there and mm, sweet potato. Okay, <laughs> this is the cue for fitness break. All right, I've got more to talk about with the food, but I do need to get you up on your feet because I don't like people sitting longer than about half an hour, and we're about there now. So what I'd like you to do is go ahead and get up on your feet. And this is Fit Quickie number 10, by the way, which is called Legs Into Play because it brings all the muscles of the legs into play quite quickly. And if you were with me yesterday, we did this then, but I'm going to teach you another version today. First, we have to get our bodies into correct anatomical functional alignment. And everyone, you look like you're up to the task. Did you guys practice before? Okay. What you want to do, let's go put our feet in parallel. I mean, toes straight ahead like you're on skis. And then what I'd like you to do is pull your abdominals in just a little bit and then grip your glutes just a little bit. All right, so do you see how that brought your pelvis into a little straighter alignment? Because most of us have weak bellies and a relaxed backside, puts pressure on the lower back. So you brought that, that into place. Then I want you to elevate the rib cage directly up from the hip. Perfect. So you didn't use your shoulders. I wanted you to use your obliques and you did it. By, that, by the way, that's a good waist exercise because you had to use these muscles to make that happen. Then roll your shoulders back as if you're pushing against the wall and push the top of your head to the ceiling. Now, straighten your legs all the way. Did, you get your, did your belly stay tight? Get it back. <laughs> get it back in the backyard again. I'm not going to check. Okay. Squeeze. Now I want you to squeeze your butt as hard as you can. Keep your legs straight and start to tap your heels onto the floor. Just move an inch or so off the floor. All right. And what you're doing here is you're strengthening the knee joint because the muscle that goes right through your knee, there's a calf muscle that goes through the knee and it strengthens those muscles and helps stabilize the joint. 
Now do you feel the calf muscles just a little bit? Working, 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 good. Now come up to the toes, down to the heel, up to the toes. Notice your balance is also a little bit challenged. If you have to grab your friend, just give them your name first, up and down. <laughs> Two. Now when you start to feel a little burn in your calf, I'd like you to just let your hand come up in the air so I can know. Okay, we're going to go until everyone's hand is up. And up to the toes, down to the heels. Up to the toes, down to the heels. Up, down, up. More hands coming up. Quickly. Four, three, two, and one. And drop down. Go ahead and put your right foot straight behind you. We're going to stretch. You might have to turn a little bit to the side. Shoulders back. And I'm going to tell you a little bit more about what you just did. You may think you just worked your calves, but you did a lot more than that. Pull your right heel off the floor and push it back down. Do you feel that through the calf muscle? Yeah. Feels good, huh? Then to the other side. See, I saved you from sedentarism, which is the disease of sitting too much. We talked a lot about that yesterday. I have a whole section in the Fit Quickies book about it. Pull that left heel off the floor. Push it back down to the floor. Ah, step up and in. Okay, go ahead and float yourself back down to your chair. Now remember what you said, is that good? <laughs> Isn't that great? Now see you feel perked up. Now, is it any wonder when we've been on our computers for you know 45 minutes we just start to get a little brain fog because our calves are a peripheral pump. They move the blood back from the lower body up to the heart and the head to stimulate circulation, get more oxygen everywhere. And it also moves your lymphatic system, which is your detox, ag detox agent. So if you're just sitting for periods of time, not only are you accelerating disease biomarkers, but you're getting sleepy, foggy, and toxed, right? Okay, willpower workout. I wanted to connect with you. I suggested to you how important the mental aspect was when you're trying to make these changes with food. And I've spoken with you about how I needed to make that change, especially the carbophobia and that kind of thing. But you can't just tell yourself intellectually to overcome habits of diet thinking that have been cemented for decades. It's very stressful for a person such as myself who has spent a lot of years fighting their hunger, trying to manage, somehow control, suppress through one means or another my hunger so I could lose weight, to understand that you don't have to be hungry. As a matter of fact, you shouldn't be leave your hunger unsatisfied to lose weight. It's very anxiety producing. And if you've been a person in that position and you said, no, you're supposed to eat till you're full, you go, but full means fat to me. How can I do that? You need stress management techniques, which is exactly what I mean by mindset mastery. And the willpower workout is one of those. I have a whole chapter in the book called the Wind Up Your Willpower. And basically it means to de-stress. Let me review on what willpower is. First, does anyone not understand that term willpower? You know what it means? You know what won't power is too, right? Yeah. All right. Those are your higher judgment factors and those are calls of the prefrontal cortex of your brain. So that part of your brain is the one that overrides the lesser decision and helps you aspire to your higher goals. It's the one that starts to go first with dementia, which is why people with dementia have these mis you know, misfiring social signals. They don't know what's appropriate to say because those parts of their brains have, are becoming diminished. The good news is you get a fresh source of this willpower via the prefrontal cortex of your brain every morning after a full night's sleep. If you've had a good night's sleep, okay, it's all restored. But guess what? It comes in limited supply. So think about it. What time of the day are you most inspired or motivated to proceed with getting your workout done, getting your good food choices, getting the dog walk, getting that project done at work. It's the morning, right? And then as the day goes on, it's like, oh, what was I thinking? You just kind of lay down and forget about it. It's not your fault. It's your biology. It's because stress hammers away at that prefrontal cortex of the brain. And I'm not talking about the worst kind of stress like you get in a car accident. I'm talking about the toast burns and you know, you can't get the bed made, the dishwasher broke, uh, things, the everyday things. They start to hammer away at that. And when it's gone, it's gone. But the good news is you can restore it easily at any point during the day. And guess what the two fundamental ways are? And if you were in yesterday's class, you probably know these, star in the chart. Breathing exercises, three to five minutes of physical activity. Huh. 
wonder if I could think of something that would be a match for that. See why I was so excited when the Fit Cookies book came together and I started doing this research and I saw it's at three to five minutes. There's another reason for peppering things in throughout the day because every time you get up and move your body, this is why you feel better. You get up and exercise, you go, oh, I just feel better. I feel like maybe I can take on this or maybe I will eat the apple instead of the cookies, you know? It just, it makes a difference for you. I suggest that people do that uh, preventatively like do make sure that you're doing those workouts through the day don't wait until you're all stressed out and then get up and do this but not that that's not a good thing now you have some immediate tools I told you I wanted you to have takeaways uh, but there are also and she mentioned the breathing what's your name yeah Caroline. Caroline mentioned the breathing exercises when you exercise what happens to your breathing you, you, yeah, you take up more oxygen, so you are doing those restorative benefits of that. And there are also specific breathing exercises that will restore that prefrontal cortex without moving. Specifically, one of them is to slow your breathing rate to four to six times per minute. And this restores heart rate variability. Have you heard about this, heart rate variability? Caroline is in the know. No, that's great. I'm so glad. You're, uh, I'm going to briefly explain this to you because it's huge in terms of stress management. Heart rate, as we know, goes up when you're under stress, right? And it drops when you're relaxed. We all understand that. But have you ever had those protracted periods of time when you're like, you know, you're all keyed up and you just know your breathing's up, your heart rate's up, but you can't get it to slow down? And many of us experience that whether we're mentally aware of it or not. What happens is under normal conditions, our heart rate variability goes up with stress and down with relaxation. But if it gets locked in to the high heart, higher heart rate, that you have lost heart rate variability. And that's one of the biggest destroyers of what we've been talking about, this power of your brain to help you make better choices. The fastest way to restore that, well besides exercise, how hard is that? Three to five minutes of doing something like you just did or taking a walk is to slow your heart rate, your breathing rate to four to six times per minute. So I'm going to take you through that for one minute, all right? We're going to do, let's go with the six breaths per minute, which is basically inhale five seconds, exhale five seconds, all right? So just where you are, get yourself comfortable. Go ahead and close your eyes and ready? Breath in, two, three, four, five, and exhale, two, three, four, Five. Inhale, two, relax your face, four, five, and exhale, let your shoulders drop down from your ears, five. Inhale, two, three, four, five, and exhale, two. Good. That's halfway there. Inhale again, two, three, four, five, and exhale, two, three, four, five. Breath in. Nice and relaxed. And exhale. Two, three, four, five. One more time. In. Two, three, four, five. And breath out. Two, three, four, five. Go ahead and open your eyes. Now you may have felt like that was a little slow down. Did anybody feel like that was slowing your breathing down? Did anyone feel like it was speeding you up at all? For most people, it's like a little bit of a slowdown, which is an indicator to you. That's very good information that maybe your heart rate is a little bit elevated, or your breathing rate, excuse me, uh, with the heart rate variability is a little accelerated. My recommendation to you is to the first thing you do when you wake up in the morning, just go through two to three minutes of that. That was five seconds in. You can count up five, count out five, use your finger to count for six you know, breaths, do it for a couple minutes. And when you get accustomed to that easily, you can do it to the four breaths a minute, which is inhale seven seconds, exhale seven to eight seconds. That gives you four breaths in a minute. By the way, that's a perfect match for Fit Quickie number one, which is seven seconds to a flat belly, where we inhale seven seconds, exhale, and hold the breath out. But you will learn, if you give yourself practice on this and create a discipline of preventative you know, stress management with this, you will learn to apply this in moments of stress. This is what I use when I wake up at 3 o'clock in the morning and all tomorrow's projects are already on your lap and you just can't stop. This is one of the techniques I'll use to get myself <coughs> relaxed and back down to sleep. But very important and why I stress that you also work with mindset mastery, it's very tied with your physiology. 
All right, here's time for the bonus plant-based tips. And we have, oh, good, we have some time here, yes? Are we good to go on our time? All right, first thing, I, I advise that you keep it simple. Remember how I described my big platter of food by the end of the day? That's my version of simple. You will have your own version. But I find that many times with people that I coach, which I do a lot of coaching with uh, helping people translate their lives to eating this way and moving this way and you know, changing their thought process and in body transformation, is we try to micromanage the plant-based stuff just like we did with the diet stuff. There's another habit of thinking. If you're a long-term um, career dieter, I guess I could have called myself a career dieter, you're so used to rules, and of course this month's rules are different from last month's rules, and, you know, they keep changing depending on which bandwagon you're on, that if you just keep it simple, and instead of, when you get the anxiety that says, I'm so used to managing this, there must be something wrong, that's what you deal with. You don't deal with trying to manage it more by struggling with micro information. Another thing is to eat to satisfaction from your first meal of the day. Now notice I didn't call it breakfast because if I say breakfast, people go, oh, I don't like to eat at seven o'clock in the morning. Well, fine, whatever your first meal of the day is, you know, if you're up a little bit later and you eat at nine, just be sure you're satisfied after that meal because that is the foundation for how you will go through the rest of the day. And if you start the day in a deficit, then you'll be chasing your hunger all day long. And also, if you're not prepared as you go through your busy day, if you don't have food with you that you're going to be able to eat because you missed you know, being satisfied at breakfast, you know it's a prescription for trouble. I invite you to pay, oh, you like this carrot over here? Like, oh. Yeah. Thank you. Um, pay attention to the processed continuum. That's a fancy way of saying going from whole foods unprocessed to the most refined possible. An example for that would be whole oat groats, which I, by the way, cook for breakfast sometimes. You ever do that? Ooh, I love that. Chop some fruit in it, put a little nuts on top. Um, from that would be steel cut oats, would be the first level of processing, and then rolled oats, which is still an unprocessed food, but it's minimally processed because something's, you know, got rolled over it. From there, it would be like the quick cooking oats that have already been cooked and chopped up even finer. And then you might have, the next step would be whole oat flour, and then the next step would be refined white oat flour. Right? So we do know that those three rules I gave you, the nutrition, the satiety, and the stretch, um, the stretch and the um, weight, respond best to the less processed you are. That was a, um, important for me too, to learn that. So pay attention to that. Don't obsess with it. Don't go around thinking, I can't eat white pasta ever again because you know that's, that's not where I want you to go. I just want you to be aware of that. By the way, I eat white pasta. People always ask me, well, do you eat this? I go, well, usually, yeah. <laughs> um, preface with the perishables. That means start out your meals. If you're looking to my ideal of my big platter of food, it's always so much easier to get the grains and the potatoes in if we start with them, right? And then we go, oh, what happened to the watery vegetables? If you can try to start out your meal with the vegetables, like lunch and dinner, either with a salad or something like that that's going to give you some initial fill factor in your belly, then that's a good strategy. And by the way, if you're thinking, oh, I don't feel like chopping and, you know, preparing, and I love salads when other people make them, you <laughs> know, that's what I always say. But think outside the salad bowl. Many times when I'm making our big sandwiches and soup for lunch, I will just get a big chunk of cabbage and a carrot and start chewing on them while I'm making the rest of the meal. That's a salad, just because it wasn't in a bowl with a fork. It's just a vegetable. You know, think outside that and learn how to satisfy it. Be prepared. You can't eat what you don't have. If you say, I'm going to eat well today, and you're going to be stuck at the office all day, and you don't have food in the fridge at work or something in your bag to go with, then you're not supporting yourself. That's the number one way to support yourself. And when I first started making these really big changes and making sure I had food around and with me, I, I taught sixth grade full time for 20 years. So are there any other school teachers in here? I love you <laughs> and I understand you. But I would get, leave the house at seven o'clock in the morning. I had a big bag of food. I'd have bread and sandwiches and salads and soups and just so I'd have the quantities. And whenever I started complaining about how inconvenient it was, here's what I tell myself. It's far more inconvenient to be fat and hungry at the same time. Okay, that got me over it really fast every single time. So be prepared. Um, level the playing field. I can't say this strongly enough. 
This whole idea of you can be a body managed eater and eat until you're full without being fat only works with a whole food, low fat, plant based diet. It will not work with the standard American diet. You can't eat burgers and fries and drink oil on your salads and expect that the satiety and the weight and the stretch and all that to work for you, you understand? Now I know we all know people in our lives that that does work for. <laughs> we all have skinny friends who ate M&Ms all day long since forever and it never seemed to affect their weight and their health. Well I did a spoiled brat syndrome on that for years, that's what I call it. For years I just wanted to be that person. And I, that is not my physiology to be able to eat like that and be of a good trim weight and be healthy. So, gotta love the playing field on it. If you want to aspire to not having hunger and not having to micromanage, then you need to order, eat according to these principles. But the beauty of it is you can give up the counting, the weighing, the measuring, the struggling, the what size am I in this week. All right. Um, detect the dents. Where are problems creeping in that you're not being mindful of? I will have people write me all the time, oh I've been doing a whole food plant based diet and I'm still struggling with my weight and I ask them to send me, send me their food diary and I always find it. I always find the problem. Case in point, this just happened about a month ago, a woman wrote me and she said, I'm just doing it all perfectly, I follow everything on the Engine 2 diet and you know all of that, I've got it all down and I'm still struggling with weight. And I said, well why don't you, you know. It turned out there were probably about three or four servings of vegetables in the day and I recommend that you have 10 to 14 including a couple fruits. She was having peanut butter at every meal and she was having this, yeah I'm trying, okay, and she says well everything improved in the book. Well that's what I call loophole thinking, you know because it's in the book also in what she was looking at was she had a cake recipe, a whole foods low fat plant based cake recipe and she was eating two pieces of that a day. <laughs> now do you see the loophole in that? It's on the list. So it was easy to find the dents in her plan and if you're you know if you're going for a chunk of chocolate every afternoon. Uh, maybe once a week would be probably okay, but if you're having that dent your diet every single day, yeah, just be honest about it. That's the value of a, a food diary, although even as I just told you, people can write it down and not see it. And support yourself. That means ha be prepared with the food that you want. Uh, keep yourself educated. Keep yourself connected as you are with other people who are aspiring to do with you, what you want to do and if you can't find them in your community, there's online communities so there's really no excuses like that. There's plenty of resources. Keep reading the books to support where you want to go and here's a big one. Avoid the diet literature at the checkout stand. They can be very alluring with their promise. But these will keep you hooked in a cycle that will keep you confused. I am all about people investigating, get to the truth of the matter, find out what makes sense to you, whose research is backed by the most number of years and studies, who has the most uh, credibility out there, and then allow yourself to immerse in that. Don't keep jerking around from one thing to another. It will just keep you in misery. So basically, show me the plants. This is my story of how to be full without being fat and I do hope that you've come away from the session with some tools that you can use and I'm very happy to answer any questions or address any issues you'd like to do right now. Yeah. So um, in terms of the whole food definition, I think I pretty much get the gist of it. You um, did show a few things with hamburger bun and you showed something with kind of like a flatbread kind of thing. So. Can you go into that? And you did say you do eat bread. Yeah. Um, so it's um, whole but minimally, proce minimally processed. Oh, okay. Like both the bun and that that was uh, lavash, which is flat bread, which is whole grain and it doesn't have any added fat in it, and it's <coughs> simply a, a coarse ground flour. So on the processed continuum, that is more processed, but it's still a whole food. So it's been kind of chopped up. So you increase the calorie concentration of it. So that can be something to pay attention to as you go along. If you find like you're stalled and you, you know if you're eating bread 20 times a day, it may uh, contribute to. I said I ate bread every bread every day, but I didn't eat bread all day. Right. Yeah. No. And then um, um, if you really do cut out all uh, 
oils. I, I see the value to actually, this could probably help me a lot. Nuts are probably one of the best things you can bring into your diet, but I'm terrified of eating them only because I like them so much. But if you do eliminate the oil, the oils, and you have nuts and avocado and olives, hopefully that will, hopefully you won't go overboard on nuts. For some people, high fat foods like that can be more of a trigger food that you want to eat a lot. But you know what my single biggest advice with that has been? Are you eating enough of the other of foods the other too? Foods. Yeah. So and just yeah. be judicious about it. And that may be helpful to you to have, find out what exactly is a one ounce of nuts because it's easy for us to. They're just so delicious for us because they're so good for our survival. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, and as I said, I do have this in the nutrition chapter in the book, and there are a bunch right outside, so if you end up having to take off early, there's um, Angela's right outside the door there. Great questions, thank you. Is there someone else I can help today? Yes? Um, you said there was a nutritional failure. What was the failure you were doing in the nutritional diet? I was not eating freely enough of the, the starchies, the you know brown rice and potatoes. I was still suffering a little bit from that carbophobia. That meant I was getting not enough of the calorie intake. Hey, this is why the cardboard and celery diet won't work. Okay, I might be able to get the stretch factor taken care of with that. I can eat lots of cardboard and celery and stretch out my gut. Or I can maybe get the weight factor, especially if I soak the cardboard, <laughs> you know. But it's not going to give me much of an, enough of the nutrition and the calorie content. And so I was constantly struggling against that. So when I left there, I cut out the oils and I started piling on more potatoes and rice and all of that. Made a big difference. Does that help? Oh, is that a butter or earth balance or something like that? You know what? And you know yourself. Don't you notice your taste changing as you go more into this, you know, the whole foods? I will use a variety of things. I have some wonderful red lentil chili that I'll put sometimes as a topper on. Sometimes I'll use a kind of a balsamic vinegar. Um, I have a 3 to one dressing that is in the plant-based blueprint that is, has no oil in it. It's three things of this, two parts of that, one part of that. Um, sometimes just a spray of pepper, um, ketchup I like, barbecue sauce, you know? That kind of thing. Yeah, um, hummus. Hummus thinned out, not a without added fat. You can thin it with a little vinegar and it makes a nice tangy little topping. Yeah, tahini sauce sometimes. Yeah. Yes? You mentioned that half your plate you included the grains and the starchy vegetables and then on top of that were maybe two cups of beans. Is there some disadvantage to just eating a lot of beans as part of that starch? No, and as a matter of fact, what's your name? Lisa. Lisa, I, I think she makes up a good point. Some people do better with less of the starches and more beans or more vegetables or more, you know, the nuts. And that's where you find your individuality. That's why I do principles here. I don't want to hand you a prescription and say this much of this, this much of this. But that is what worked really well for me. And if I want to, if I've had a little too many Thanksgivings, too many of those, you know, those celebratory times and I want to nudge down a little bit, I will really make sure that I nudge up the watery content vegetables and make sure I get more of that before I eat my starchies, maybe some more of the beans. And beans, I tell you, I just put up on my blog, if you can get beans for breakfast, it just makes such a difference. But my problem, you should go read that article. I've got a new recipe up. I can do it in Mexico, but somehow it never translated up to, you know, <laughs> Chico Hills. But I came up with this uh, a recipe that I call sweet bean cream. It's white beans with soaked dates and a little bit of raw almond butter. And I whip it up and I stir it into my oatmeal. And it's bean for breakfast, but it just tastes like sweet cream. So it just went up on my blog, the recipe. So I invite you to go check it out. Yeah. Yes? Beans and gas. I mean, yeah. yeah, yeah, well you can do a couple things about that. If you're new to the bean, you need to work them in slowly. You can also pressure cook them so that they're really well cooked. You can pressure cook them twice, so the first cook is, uh, cook them halfway, drain the water off, then do new water, it's a little more problematic, but that always takes the gassy effect out of it. You can cook your, your beans with a little bit of kombucha seaweed in them, that tends to dissipate that for you. And it may be a matter of quantity. Another thing is to sprout them first. You ever done that? Um, I'll do that with the lentils a lot. Um, you'll just soak them overnight and then let it sprout out their little tails a couple days later, then cook them as usual. And what it does is change the enzymatic action in them so that they're very easily digestible. So there's a few suggestions for that. 
I want to thank you so much. I think we have another team coming on in yeah. here. I appreciate you've been wonderful today. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll be right outside of my book table. Hope